Wow, what a great Lord's Day we've had thus far, huh? Joining in Lily so that she could display to you in obedience what Christ has done in her life, to seeing these young families commit to raise their children in the discipline of the Lord, to present these young men and young women a copy of God's Word to enhance their study and, in turn, increase their affection and obedience to the Lord. And for all of us right here, right now, collectively and corporately, joining in on the song that's already happening around the throne of God, I would say it has been a great Lord's Day. And we're to continue this theme as we look at faith and the family. You know, when you prepare a sermon, I'll be honest, it's a whole lot like cooking a meal. And when you hear a sermon, even more honestly, it's a lot like consuming one. Now, there's a lot of junk food that's out there today. I would encourage you not to feast on these sermons. There are no nutrients in them. There's also some sermons that are a lot like a dessert sermon. They're delicious. They're filled with sweet truths. And we need these sermons, but we can't have desserts for every meal. There's also some meat sermons. They take a lot longer to chew on and to digest. They're heavier messages. But you and I need this protein from the Word. And then today... A sermon like I'm about to preach to you, and let me just say, I am so sorry, but you're about to get a vegetable sermon. (laughs) You're about to get a plate full of Brussels sprouts and asparagus, and for some of you that's exciting, but others of you, you realize it's going to be very easy to chew, but a bit harder to swallow. Our message this morning is entitled, Cultivating Courageous Children for Christ. And I'm going to reference many passages this morning. Typically, most of you know if you've heard me preach, I'm an expositional preacher. I go verse by verse. But this morning, we're going to look at what God's Word has to say about some important truths that families must incorporate into the lives of their homes. You know, a couple of years ago, I was out for a run in my neighborhood. And as I was jogging along, minding my own business, I looked up ahead and I saw in a yard a very large dog. Now, I live in a very dense area, so dogs don't roam the streets like they do in the country. They're usually fenced up. But this dog was sitting smack dab in the middle of the yard. And so at that moment, as a runner, I have three decisions. My first one is I thought, I'll stop, I'll wait, I'll assess the situation and see what the dog does. But if you're a runner, you know that's really not an option. For some of you, if you're a non-runner, you've stopped at a stoplight and you've seen the runner there waiting on the traffic, but they're still jogging in place. That's how we feel. We're just too prideful to stop. So my second option was to just turn around. I thought to myself, you know, I don't have to stop. I could just go a different direction. But I realized that this was the route I had established to run. This was the route I thought about sitting in this office. This was the route I was going to complete. Plus, to make it more practical, I pay taxes for those roads. That dog contributes nothing to society except for what he does for the people who live in the four walls of that house. So I kept going. And then thirdly, as I approached the house, what you think happened probably happened. The dog's ears perked up. He turned. He looked to me. He rose up to his legs, and he started to come after me. And I was left with the worst option, which was to make a run for it. And as I was running, my body told me, you need to stop. But my mind says, you're a young man, you're strong, you're vibrant, you can outrun this dog. Well, the dog began to gain on me. And he got closer and closer and closer. And I looked back in mid-sprint, and I noticed the dog had come to a complete stop. And I noticed the whole time he'd been on a really long leash (laughs) to a stake that was stuck in the ground. Now, why do I share that? Well, it reminds me a whole lot of our enemy, Satan. And if you were to look at our enemy, Satan, he is like a rabid, vicious dog on a leash. Now, let me tell you, don't be too alarmed because our sovereign God has his hands on that leash. Now, there are times that God pulls up the leash of Satan and does not give him much latitude. And it's during these times that it seems like his capabilities and capacities to wreak havoc on the people of God are very limited But I think you would agree with me this morning. If we look at this moment in human history, doesn't it feel like the Lord has given Satan a very long leash? The sin that was once on the back streets is now being paraded in front of our children on the main streets. What do we do when Satan's on a long leash? What do we do in 2021 to face the storm that is coming towards us? I'll tell you what we do. We cultivate courageous children 
for Christ. Say that three times fast. In the book of 1 Chronicles chapter 12, there's a listing of King David's mighty men. Verse 32 is very interesting, and sometimes it gets lost in all of the print. But it says this, of Issachar, men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. We need Christians today. We need families today. We need churches today that are like the men of Issachar. They understand the times, and they know what to do. Now, I'm not saying you got to be like culture to reach culture. I'm not a student of culture. I don't pay a whole lot of attention to what's going on in culture. But here is what I am saying. Satan is taking the same lies that he has from the beginning in the garden throughout history, and he is continuously repackaging these lies to deceive new generations. And boy, does he have a package that's wrapped up with a bright, shiny bow on it for our children. Satan wants to destroy your families. He wants to destroy your home. He wants to destroy this church, and he wants to destroy our children. Listen to 1 Peter 5, verse 8. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Our kids are being sent into a world, and as they're being sent into this world, I'm not so sure they're ready for the landmine of lies that our enemy has set for them. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 7, this is Moses speaking to the people of Israel. He says, you shall teach them diligently to your children. This is the word of God. And shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise. See, Moses is calling the people of God to teach the truths of God to their children in all places and all times. And I would say that we're commended to do the same today here in 2021. But this will not, this cannot happen if we continue to compartmentalize our lives. And often we approach our lives like a cake and we want to slice it up into different portions and pieces. Some are bigger than others and those are usually the ones that go on my plate after dinner. But we cut a piece for school. We cut a piece for work and recreation and family. And honestly, many of us cut a slice for the faith. But let me share something with you, not just to shock you, but to hear me out. Faith should not even be our biggest slice of this cake. In fact, faith should not even have a slice in our cake. And the reason is this. Faith should be the breading of the cake. Faith should be the thing that fills every slice that we cut for school, work, recreation, and family. It's asking, how does faith center in my life? How does faith influence how I work? How does faith influence what we do with our kids in school? How does faith influence what we put on our calendar, how we spend our money? How does faith influence what we allow to come into our homes? And if we settle for just continually slicing another piece of our life for the faith, that slice will get smaller and smaller. And as a result, we will not cultivate courageous children for Christ. We will cultivate cowardly children for Christ and send them into the landmine of lies the enemy has waiting on them. This is war. And each truth that I'm going to share with you today is going to be like the bottom of an orange display in the produce section of your grocery store. If you pull any of these truths away from our church or your home, here's what's going to happen. The rest are going to crumble. These are absolutes and exclusives. They are foundational. They are fundamental to sending courageous children for Christ into the world. So if you're a note taker, you can follow along and write down this. Courageous children believe scripture is exclusively the word of God. Our children are walking into a world today where they're hearing phrases like, this is my truth and that's your truth. It's a deep pull of relativism. And what that means is truth changes. Truth changes from person to person, from culture to culture, from time to time, to circumstance to circumstance. I mean, we even live in such a world where people don't want to get down to the absolute that two plus two equals four. And you can believe all day long that gravity doesn't exist. You can print up t-shirts, you can start a coalition, you can make yard signs, You can go to the largest city in the nation, you can get on the highest high rise in the nation, and you can jump off. And even if you don't believe in gravity, I think we all know what's going to happen. You're going to fall to a sudden abrupt death. Because it really doesn't matter if a person does not believe something, if they don't think it's their truth, it still doesn't change the fact that it is truth. And the Bible should be the source and the standard of all truth in our lives. 
2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, listen to this. All scripture is breathed out by God. Some of your versions may say inspired. In other words, this book, it doesn't just contain the word of God. It is literally the word of God. And it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Let me be straight. I've been doing this for a while with students and children in the context of local church. Our kids do not need any more watered-down attempts to make the Bible relevant. You don't make the Bible relevant. The Bible is more relevant than tomorrow's newspaper. Our children need a five-course meal full of the truths of the Word of God given to them at our dinner tables, around their bedside, and in our Sunday school classes, in our homes and churches every single week. And I'll tell you, an excellent place to start is to read the Scriptures in your home. Excellent place to start is to teach Bible stories before bed. Have family devotionals. Have family worship. This morning as you came in, you received a booklet that looked a whole lot like this right here because this is what you got in your hands. And inside here, this is the Geyer Catechism. Now, a catechism is a simple way to teach doctrinal truth to anyone, but particularly children, through a question and answer format. Many catechisms are 100 to 150 questions, which we've done in our home. And they take a long time to do, and they can be wordy. I would commend you to work yourself towards that. But if you want to begin teaching or add to the teaching that you're doing in your home with your children, start with this 30-question introductory training will catechism to help you get started to teach this truth of the Word of God to your kids. It's not my truth, your truth. It's the truth, and we must steer and point them towards that. But secondly, courageous children not only believe the Bible is exclusively the Word of God, they also believe, number two, that God is exclusively sovereign. All that exists today did not come forth by the evolutionary process that society is shoving into the faces of our children. Our children must know that God is creator, and as a result, he is sustainer. And then we have to step back and realize, because of those two realities, this is his world. And since it's his world, it's his rule, and it is his rules. And this generation is coming up into the face of groups of people who are literally secular humanists. What I mean by that is this. They believe that you just make up your own rules. You make up your own truth. You are literally your own authority and your own God. And if you want to see that displayed, practically speaking, look at the godless mindset that has increased in our society today where there is a growing animosity towards people and things in authority. You realize what many are calling our generation to do? is to deconstruct and tear down everything in our society. And that includes your home, your family, and our churches because of the truth that we stand on. We cannot allow people to build a foundation for our children that is on godlessness. We must build the foundation that is on godliness. And that begins understanding that God is in charge. He is exclusively sovereign. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27 tells us that creation order and it says here that God created man in his own image. And you know, ever since then, people have been trying to return the favor to the Lord. Countless people trying to create a God made in their own image and liking. Our kids must know, we must proclaim to the world, we don't get to decide who God is. God has decided that and he has communicated to that, that truth to us through his word. And if we're honest... I will be. I believe we've made some things in our home sovereign that do not need to be sovereign, that we have tried to make some things in our home to take the place of God. And as a result, that becomes an idol in our home and sometimes in our churches, sports, money, career. In some homes, the children have become sovereign. They're the ones ruling the roost, and it messes up the God-ordained order that he has established. Do our children see our homes and our church as a place where God is sovereign, where they would say, God is in charge here. This is God's place. A practical way to do that is to make your home a place of prayer where you're praying regularly as a family, not just the perfunctory prayers before meals that you're supposed to pray, but before bed. Right when a problem arises, you immediately engage that problem with prayer before God with your children. Not just that, if you get blessed with something good, you immediately stop and give thanksgiving and praise to a sovereign God who made that happen. Prayer is the ultimate expression of our dependency upon the sovereign of God, sovereignty of God. And our children need to experience and feel that, and we set that standard for them. 
I would encourage you to fill your home with sound music about the Lord. I would encourage you to fill your home with music that children will be engaged with. I'll be honest, hymns are a great way to do this. We do this in our home. We fill our home with hymns. And it's a great tool as they read hundreds and hundreds of years, as they listen to hundreds and hundreds of years of theology that have been sung by the church, given to them. They see a grander, a larger view of the Lord. Teach your children God is sovereign because courageous children believe it and live it. Thirdly, courageous children believe people are absolutely sinful. This generation is getting a steady barrage of phrases like love yourself and you're enough. And what this has done is created a society of entitlement. It has created a society of self-centeredness. You know, Scripture actually tells us just the opposite. We're not to go love ourselves We're to pick up our cross and deny ourselves. Scripture tells us that we are emphatically not enough. But praise be to God, there is one who was and is and will always be. And his name is Jesus Christ. He was enough for you. He was enough for me. He was enough for our children. Things in society today that are sinful are being celebrated as a virtue. And in all honesty, things that are not sin at all are being called unforgivable to our children. We have a culture where it's even in vogue not to own your own sin. We've seen this ever since the beginning of time. When they sinned in the garden, Adam blamed Eve and Eve blamed the serpents. And it's interesting that the world who is telling our kids to be offended by anything and everything and the very ones lecturing them about it top the music charts with the most vile lyrics you would ever hear. The world in which we're sending our children into is as Jeremiah 6.15 as he described Israel in this day. Were they not ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. There's no shame in Israel in this day. There was no embarrassment for their sins. And today I would say the very same thing about the society in which we live. There's no shame. There's no embarrassment. Our people have forgotten how to blush. And if the world is pushing this down on our children, and our children do not understand sinfulness. They're going to be utterly confused when they step out of our homes and out of our churches and into the world. They're going to diagnose problems in life incorrectly and continuously try to apply the wrong remedy. When really, at the essence, at the base of it all, at the core of it all, the problem is our sin, and the only remedy to that sin is found in the person and work of Jesus Christ. We must guard our home against sinful influences. Practically speaking, there's so many things we could say on that, but I would just say if you give a child unfiltered, unchecked access to the internet today, you are throwing the enemy a hanging curveball, and he's going to make it out of the park at your children's expense. Guard your home. Is your home a place where sins are kept on a short account? What I mean by that, as soon as sin begins to bubble up, are they properly confessed and disciplined in short order. Number four, courageous children believe salvation is exclusively in Jesus. You know, our children are left wondering in an age of pluralism, and here's what I mean by that. It's the idea that all roads lead to the same place just as long as you're sincere. But you know what the old saying is, you can be sincere and sincerely wrong. You know, as you look at this place, there are multiple entrances into this building. From the sides to the back to the top to behind me, you can get into this room in so many different ways. And this is a picture of the world in a sense where this generation is hearing, pick the door that's right for you. Follow your own heart. You can pick any door you choose just as long as it's not the one that says Christianity above it. Truth is, there's only one door for salvation, isn't there? And our children must be shown that Jesus says in Matthew 7, the narrow way is the way that leads to life. We must point them to the narrow way. Jesus tells us in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Notice he doesn't say a way, a truth, a life. It is exclusive. It is the way. And even though it's exclusive, you are invited to experience life in him. The gospel is light. There are so many reasons I believe the gospel, but one reason is because it is light. And notice as you look at what's going on in our culture today, darkness is pushing against Christianity and will continue to harder than any other thing because it is light. Notice darkness never pushes back against darkness. 
The world is preaching a social gospel today to our children. It's filled with propaganda. Do you know what good propaganda is? It's come up with a phrase that you can't disagree with. And our children are hearing a lot of great one-liners that on their own sound excellent. I can get on board with that. But when you begin to define the terms, and we must always define the terms for our kid to say what we mean and to help them understand what we mean by what we said, when we begin to define those, we realize these are godless ideologies that are being thrown into our children's face. It is literally another gospel. It's like a Category 5 hurricane is brewing out in the ocean. And all is calm on the beach. It's not here yet. Kids are building sandcastles. Parents are catching some sun. Youth are playing volleyball. And the church is setting up the tents and the grill and ready for a barbecue. And that's all well and fine. But are we ready for the storm that's going to crash the shore? And will our children be able to stand? Because that storm that's coming, it's another gospel. It's persecution. It's tolerance. Masked as intolerance. It's cancel culture. It's virtue signaling. It's political correctness. And it will be forced down on our children. And they either get in line or they get pushed out. And I pray we raise up a generation that says, I'm not getting in that line. I'm going through this narrow way. I'm going through that door. We must defend and declare the gospel to this generation. We do no good watering down the gospel. We do no good telling half truths. They need all the gospel not just our favorite parts of it. Do our children see our homes and our church as a place where the gospel is not just a one-time decision? I hope you realize God will not be anyone's co-pilot. He's in the cockpit. He calls the shots. Or is the gospel something that impacts how we live daily in front of our children? So they see the gospel is a work that is started in us, that God continues in us, and he will bring it to completion one day. Number five, courageous children believe Sundays are absolutely the Lord's day. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 25 says, not neglecting to meet together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The writer of Hebrews explicitly commands us here to be a part of the local church, not neglect gathering with the body. In fact, if you look at the New Testament, there is no category in the New Testament for a believer who is living life apart from the local church. Now, I realize our children will say sometimes, I don't want to go to church. And I think in confession here, as adults, we probably have all said that as well. And sometimes, and we mean well, we say, well, I don't want to make them, I don't want to force them because I might turn them off of God later in life. And I get what happens there. But what if we apply that logic to every area of our life? What if one day a child came to me and he said, Dad, I don't want to brush my teeth anymore. I'm like, well, honey, let's, why not make them? I don't want to turn them off Colgate forever. No, we would require that which is good for our children. And that which is the best on the list of the good is the Lord's church. In our homes, we must make a declaration that there is never a Saturday that this question will be asked. Hey, mom, dad, are we going to church tomorrow? It's just a given. Your family is a place that says, unless we are providentially hindered, we will be here. You know, the church is the bride of Christ in the New Testament. And what an incredible picture that is. But there's an attitude that permeates so much in evangelical culture that will say, oh, I love Jesus, but I don't like his church. And we don't want to raise children who claim to love Jesus and not like his church. In fact, if you were to come up to me and you go, Brad, I love you, but I don't like Katie. You realize we're not going to be good. We're not going out for a round of golf after that. And it's the same with Christ. You can't say, I love you, Christ, but I hate your bride. We must live in a way that exalts the bride of Christ, because I hope you've picked up an undertone here of everything I've said. There's probably going to be persecution that's going to ramp up. Maybe not for you, maybe not for me, maybe not for your children, but what about your grandchildren? What about your great-grandchildren? We can't be so naive to think that this might not happen. But here's the silver lining to persecution. The superficial church, the worldly church, it won't stand. They have no footing. They have nothing to stand on. There's no sacrifice there. And it will be a purging and purification of Christ's bride. For too long, 
Many non-believers, many kids in the church have watched Christ's bride be dressed up and flaunted before carnal men. You handle a man's life like, wife like that, there will be recompense to pay one day. This has got to stop. We must show our children the glory, the beauty of Christ's bride in all her purity. And I see that here this morning in this church. What our children say, Sundays are sacred in our home. Number six, God exclusively defines sexuality. Courageous children believe this, and the world is trying to normalize a distorted view of sexuality to our children. This is clear as there's attacks on the institution of the family, babies in the womb, biblical manhood and womanhood. It is like we're living on the pages of Romans chapter 1. And if you go, what do you mean by that? I would encourage you today or this week to go and read Romans chapter 1. And Jesus defines gender and marriage when he quotes Genesis chapter 2 in Matthew 19. Listen to verses 4 and 5. He answered, have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Our children need to know that God has created man and woman, husband and wife, mother and father. God has made each of them equal before him. But let's face it, he has designed them differently. They are complementary to each other. And a great example of this is if your kid is on the bike and they have a bike wreck, What does the dad say? Get up, brush it off. There's no bone showing. But what does the mom say? Oh, come here, baby. Let me look at you. Let me clean you up. There's a conqueror and there's a nurturer rolled into the home. And that must be displayed to our children. We need a Titus II model. And here's what I mean by that is older men need to be training younger men to be men. And older women need to be training younger women to be women. Now, please hear me. I'm not that guy that's up here. And I know some of you, you're, you're, maybe you're already sensing it, that I'm a chauvinist. I'm not a chauvinist. I'm not saying that women have to be barefoot and pregnant in the kitchen. I'm not saying that men wear the pants and women wash them. Don't hear me saying that. I'm not saying any of that at all. But here's what I do want you to hear me say. Men, it's time to step up. It is time to cast off our passivities before God and shepherd the homes that God has entrusted to us. You will stand before God and give an account to that. I will stand before God and give an account to that. And that makes me shudder. 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verse 13 says, be watchful, stand firm in the faith, be strong. Now, I did leave out three words there because I want to highlight them. I want them to pop off the page here. Act like men. God has defined these roles. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they hid. And the problem is you can't play hide and seek with someone who knows everything and is everywhere. But when God came into the garden and he began to call, did he say, Eve, where are you? No. Well, who ate the fruit? Eve ate the fruit first. Adam followed. But he said, Adam, where are you? Men, we are accountable and we must step up and guard our homes. Are our homes and church a place where the glory of God, where the design of God is on display in masculinity and femininity? It is a beautiful thing that God has made. Let's not reject that. Let's lean into that and celebrate it. Number seven, courageous children believe eternity is absolutely sure. Many parents do an excellent job of raising their kids for this life. And that's biblical. We should raise them for this life. You teach them to groom. And here at the church, we thank you for that. Teach them to change a tire, manage money, play an instrument, throw a curveball. These are excellent, but they all should be secondary to the primary. The things that are happening in this life, they're just a big dress rehearsal for what's around the corner. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 tells us that every knee, your knee, my knee, our kid's knee, will bow before Jesus, and every tongue, your tongue, my tongue, our kids' tongues, before Jesus will confess that he is Lord. Eternity is sure. It's going to happen in a real heaven and a real hell, and we've got to have an eternal perspective in raising our children in this generation. 
In other words, we are teaching them, you are not to live for this world. There's another one coming. The temporal things of this life are going to fade away. We must hold on to things with a loose grip. Am I preparing my children for eternity? Am I showing them how to pray, how to worship, how to study scripture, how to serve, how to give, how to witness? I have no idea who said this. I do not know who to attribute this quote to, but it's gold. Quote, we must teach our kids to live with the wisdom that Jesus might not come back for a thousand years, but with the urgency that he will return tomorrow, end quote. When it comes to eternity, I've had to face the fact, and I'm still working through this, would my family, would my child look at me and go, yeah, dad, he, he says it, but he really doesn't believe it's coming. Or would she even look at me and go, I don't think he actually believes it at all. Would our lives and home and church reflect that eternity is on the horizon? If I had time this morning, and these will not be on the screen, I would add three more as I've just thought through this weekend, as this message has marinated in my heart. I'll tell you number eight, courageous children believe God absolutely ordains suffering. It's got to be an orange on the bottom of our produce display. If you pull that out, the rest is going to fall. There's too many books and pastors and churches teaching and every day is a Friday theology. Life is hard. God ordains and allows suffering and it's difficult, but it's for our good and his glory. Our children must know this. I would also add in there, number nine, courageous children believe stewardship absolutely glorifies God. Now that's a broad term, but stewardship is taking care of the things that God has entrusted to us. A part of being a steward is work. You realize work is one of the most godliest things that exists because work was in place before the fall. God put Adam and Eve in the garden and he said, tend it, work it before sin came. We will work and we will worship in heaven one day. Just practically speaking, our kids need to sweat. It is okay to send them out there and make them dig a hole. It's okay to take out the trash. But let's turn that on ourselves. Our kids need to see us working, and particularly here in the local church, using our gifts that God has given to us, empowered by the Holy Spirit for the glory of God. Then number 10, if I had time, I would break this one down a bit more as well. Courageous children believe Steady discipline is biblical. I think we have a generation not been disciplined. And in discipline, the punishment must fit the crime. So we're not just talking about discipline. We're talking about correction. We're talking about steering them in the right direction. So as we conclude this morning, next few minutes that we have, I'm pretty certain there's a variety of emotions on our hearts right now. So let's just air some of those out because I've said a whole lot in a short amount of time. I know some of you, you're pretty fired up as you hear this, as you've thought about this, you've come in this way. I've heard many old preachers say in many, many sermons, you're so fired up, you're ready to charge the gates of hell with a water pistol. And now I tell you, let's do it. Grab the flag and plant it in your yard and declare with Joshua in Joshua 24, 15, but as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Mark your children with these absolutes and exclusives. But others of you here this morning, as I'm airing it out, you might have tension with what I've said. And I heard it said just this past year, the problem with preachers today is that nobody wants to kill them anymore. And there's some truth to that. But in all seriousness, there may be disagreement, but no, my heart is not to be disagreeable I've not said anything publicly today that's not been said in the four walls of my house, shepherding the little flock that God has entrusted to me. Some of you, you don't have kids in the house anymore and you're sitting there and you feel like you've missed the mark. A purpose of a message like this is not to bring guilt or shame to you at all. If you've missed somewhere with your children, if you're able, the conditions are right, one of the most powerful things you could do is pick up the phone and call them and simply ask for their forgiveness. If they reject that, if they don't want that, please know you did the right thing before the Lord. And do not ever, ever allow anyone or even yourself hold a sin over you that Christ has washed away in his blood. Others of you, you're sitting there, you're going, I dotted every I, I crossed every T, and my child is still not following Christ. 
That's not on you. You realize that you can do it right and still have a prodigal. There's no guarantees that any of our children will be courageous for Christ. The only guarantee is they will be cowardly if we sit by the wayside and do nothing. Many of the verses in the Bible, please don't mistake them as promises. If I do this, this will happen in my parenting. No, no, no. They're more probabilities. They're more principally based. It's more of a likelihood than a guarantee. So if you're here this morning and you totally missed it with your kids, you think, I wish I could go back and do it again, which we all do in some capacity. Or maybe you've never had an opportunity with children. You've seen a lot of families represented in this service today. They need your prayers. They need your presence in their lives. You have a second chance. And if there's any way we could connect you with families who need you, let us know. We can intersect you with them. Others of you, you're sitting here and you've seen some of these sweet babies and you're wrestling or maybe you've struggled with having children. And some well-meaning person has come to you and said, don't bring children into the world. Do you see what's going on? Did you not hear what that guy said this morning about how bad things are out there? Why would you bring a children, children into the world? But let me tell you, let me propose to you, I don't think there's a better time than today to bring a child into the world and to raise up a little disciple for the kingdom. And when you do that, here's what you're doing. You will raise up a little disciple and you're going to be shaking grains of salt on a decaying world and shining beams of light into utter darkness. And then finally, I bet there's a group of you here. You look at what's going on out there and you're scared to death. You just want to lock your children up, slide food under the door and wait until Jesus comes back. And I totally get that. But you know as well as I do, that's not what God has called us to do. Listen to what he says in Psalm 127 verse 4. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the children of one's youth. The Bible here calls children arrows. And when they're under the care of our home and when they're under the care of our church, here's what we're doing. We're sturdying up those feathers to make them aerodynamic. We are strengthening a sharp point so it will land and stick exactly where we send it. And then at the right time and in the right way, we pull back our bow and we fire our little arrows that God has given us into the world, into the darkness to glorify him. Would you join me in this place and in our homes and make it archery ranges for the glory of God and send these little arrows into the next generation to penetrate the darkness, to bring the good news of the gospel, and they will stand firm as they fly.